So before we get started, I also wanted to thank uh, Mithili Byerman, who's on the NCET board, and she's our Vice President of Strategy. Uh, she did a presentation a few, a few weeks ago. It was actually her idea that we do this, and she's been um, super instrumental in helping us coordinate everything. So, um, which does lead to what Cinema was talking about. We've been doing this for a long time. We've had to figure out some things, sometimes the hard way, sometimes the easy way, as far as collaboration. And um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today applies in the real world as much as it does the virtual world. It's just you're super more aware of it in the virtual world than you are um, than in the real world because you make some assumptions in the real world. But, and those are assumptions maybe you shouldn't make. So I think all of this is going to work for you if you, you know, when we go back to, to um, bricks and mortar. So like Cinema was saying, um, collaboration is hard. Um, being able to share ideas with somebody else um, and, have, and listen to their ideas back to you and to find out sometimes that what you're talking about is not maybe the best idea, that's all really difficult. And then you can see on this chart that we found, 71% of people in the UK think that um, collaboration suffers when workers don't share a space. 67% say um, the same thing when you're not sharing the uh, same space. Um, hopefully that changes as more and more people are, are working virtually, they are collaborating mm -hmm. through Zoom and through Ring Central, and that does change. Um, but here's the other challenge, is people don't pay attention. You get on a conference call, you get on a, on a call like this, you hide your picture, and you go to the bathroom, you're, you're doing other work, you're checking your social media, some people play video games. So that also compounds the problem, right, um, with virtual. If you're in an actual in-person meeting, that's a lot harder to do, though we've all been in in-person in collaboration meetings where you have your computers open ostensibly to take notes, but you're <coughs> doing the same thing. You're checking your email, you're checking your order from Amazon or something else. And so all of these challenges, again, reflect both, but it is a little bit more challenging for virtual. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today are, is the human stuff, um, how, how we treat each other as people, um, some fun creative exercises that Danny's gonna talk about, how to be creative. And again, that's a lot easier to do when you can, when you can leave your house and go someplace else or have an in-person meeting. That's a lot easier to be creative than when you're stuck at home. So she's got some good ideas on that. And then Edward is gonna talk about um, technology. As Cinnamon said, a lot of the technology we've already figured out, uh, or you started to, but again, we've been doing this as an agency for 12 years. I first went out on my own working at home in 1997 when my son was born. And that was very, very different experience than it is now. Technology is constantly changing. We're constantly learning new things. Um, so we're going to start with Edward is going to talk to us about the importance of uh, company culture. And then I'll talk about human stuff. And then Danny will talk about fun uh, creative stuff. And then Edward will go back to um, technology. Edward. Okay, so Jack, you go ahead and put put the first slide in the next slide so when i'm talking about um you know the human stuff really we're talking about we talk about the culture and you know what is culture really to me i have always believed that culture is best conveyed through um what is communicated and how a person behaves and acts um so obviously there's a big difference between bricks and mortar versus virtual um in that and so like Jackie said, though, um, as as I'm as we're having this conversation, um, I don't want you guys to think that whatever we're providing conversation-wise is just for virtual, because I we I really believe that a lot of this stuff comes back into the bricks and mortar, and and it will help uh, in the long run. And you know what I know that everybody said that people have said that we've been in, uh, doing this virtually for 12 years. The reality is we also have been uh, bricks and mortar for like 16 years previously to that. So we, we know the difference between going bricks and mortar and virtual. There isn't, uh, it wasn't like we started a company on virtual only. So go ahead and forward the next slide, Jackie. Or the, so when we talk about bricks and uh, communication and action, um, 
I got to tell you guys, bricks and mortar from a collaboration and creative standpoint is easier to do it there. And the reason why is it's more convenient. If you're in a cubicle setting or if you've got a office mate, it's easy to pop, it, pop your head out and say, hey, what do you think about this? And then next thing you know, you're having a conversation. Oftentimes, I remember when um, as an art director, I'd go in and paste something on the, the wall and then just have the whole creative team start chiming in. Kind of hard to do um, in a uh, virtual setting because you don't know exactly who's where they're at, uh, you know, whether people are at meetings or whether they're at their desks or whether they're actually working. And so it's a little bit more difficult in, in, in a um, virtual setting to be able to achieve that. So, Jackie, go ahead and next one. Um, is it coming? <laughs> So you really have to reach out and touch someone. So that goes back to 1987 when there wasn't an internet and we were talking on the phone. So what we found that in a virtual culture, there is a lot more work that has to be done in a sense that it's, it's not something that, you know, there's a lot of unspoken stuff that happens that automatically creates the culture. Um, it's stuff that you see, it's stuff that you hear. It's stuff that you smell, like who, you know, I can tell who likes what food just based on what, what they're cooking in the microwave in the office. All those things go out the door when you're dealing with the virtual because you're out kind of in a silo of your own and you don't have that. So you have to go pick up the phone, pick, do video conferencing and work harder at connecting with people and get to know people at a different level. So go ahead and next one, Jackie. So when we talk about creating this culture, you have to, I know that the first two weeks, everybody's been so concerned about technology. How do I access the server? How do I get to these files? How do I share these files with somebody? How do I communicate? And I'm not saying that technology isn't important. It's just that when you're thinking about culture, technology has no role in it other than it is a tool. And that at the end of the day, you really have to value the human spirit because if you want collaboration and if you want uh, creativity to come out of your organization, then you basically need to make sure as, you know, that you value that human spirit and that you create uh, a culture that the, where that human spirit can, can rise and, 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 and uh, be free and, and, and again, can come out because that's you know, as a creative, you know, as an agency, you know, creativity is the number one, one of the things that we're judged on. And for us, that, that's something that we have to value. And so again, the humans are the ones doing that and not the machines. So go ahead and next one, Jackie. Um, so when, you, when we start talking about culture, the thing that, that comes to me first is that, uh, you know, it always begins with the leader. And so for those of you that owns business, businesses or a, or a management level, uh, you know, that, that's attending this, this webinar, this really begins with kind of your attitude as a boss. I, and I know, again, when, when we say don't be your stereotypical boss, I think when I think about that stereotypical boss, it's a micromanager that wants to tell people how to do their job and how to do it. Um, it's a person that can, that actually has to be a part of everything. It's kind of like when you think about a wheel, they're the center hub and everything else uh, spokes out of them. And you can't do this from a virtual workplace. I mean, I'm a, I consider myself a type A person. And I, this is one of the things I had to learn is to not be that type A person and have to lead in a different way. And so again, this starts with that attitude that you're going to do it. So go ahead on the next one. Um, and so what it really, you, what you really have to start working on is um, when you're trying to create this culture and as a boss, you're trying to figure out how you're going to make this happen or as a manager, part of it is you really have to start reflecting what you want to see. And when I say that, it's really modeling that behavior that you want. Um, for instance, in the, in the past, I would, um, hello. For instance, in the past, I would, I would, uh, you know, be able to, like I said, say something to somebody, do this job, do it this way, da da da. I can't do that anymore. 
I have to be more or less, uh, now I, I, I have to do things differently. So if I want people to collaborate, I have to be the one to kind of start the collaboration. And so I, one of the things I noticed when we went virtual was I have to reach out and touch someone and have to do it quite often and, and, and keep on connecting. And then soon over time, what I found was my people would mimic that behavior but it didn't happen overnight. It, isn't, it didn't happen because I said, hey, you guys go out and call each other, or hey, you guys go out and get on a video conference with each other and figure this out. It had to be something that I, it had to begin with me, and they had to see my behavior, um, not what, again, not what I said, but more my action and what I do for them to mimic that. And again, that, that comes from leadership. Go ahead, Jackie, on the next one. So, you know, and again, as a leader, we always say this, everybody, and, and I know everybody says it, we, val we should value people. But in a virtual environment, you really have to create that environment where you um, value uh, a human being because, you know, again, there's, it, it starts with trust. If you, if you, you know, when you value somebody, you trust them. And it takes time to develop that trust. And that trust, again, is, is, it, it, it's that hard work that you got to put in. As a boss, for instance, one of the things I've done is I've done one more more one on one meetings and not from a i'm I'm going to check up on you and spy on you and see what you're doing, but more of a check in of how are you doing uh, how can I help you? Are you having problems and you know can I make recommendation or can I you know bring in another teammate to come in and help that person with that problem? I think those are important things to do, and again once uh, as a leader, you start showing that and they start seeing it, I think you'll start seeing that culture rise. Go ahead on the next slide. So how do you get the team's buy-in? Um, click on the next one. Uh, I think it starts with values. And I think a lot of people focus a lot on their mission statement and their vision statement. And hell, they'll even throw in their values. But I... I would almost say nine out of 10 organizations that I know, they'll create all these statements and then it goes on a shelf somewhere. Um, values is one of those unique things that for me, as you know, having gone from bricks and mortar, uh, we, did, we did that exactly. We kind of shelved those values and shelved the, create, uh, the, the uh, vision and mission statement. But when we went to um, virtual, I, I kind of came back to this that, you know, a company truly is, you know, well, who is it and what is their brand and who are they? It's really how they act and behave every day and how I act and behave every day. Those are my values that I reflect. And so it's important as an organization to create this as a group and not only to create it, but to actually start using it every day. And it's going to take time, but it's gotten to the point that it's become second nature for us with our values. It's like, you know, I'll, I'll, once in a while, every three months, I'll dust it off and bring him up and people will be reminded of him that, well, you can go, oh yeah, we do that. We do that. So again, it's second nature, but it, it really starts there. If you can build a values as a group, I think that helps. And that's where it first begins. So go ahead and next one. And so you build it, but then what do you do with it? And now it's really starts to be one of those things that you use as a guideline. Um, so it's a guideline. Yes, it's a guideline for hiring as you continue to build your team, but we have also actually used it as a guideline for, uh, selecting our customers because again, it, it we, we tend to be happier with customers who match our values, customers that don't, we tend to have more friction with, and these are things that we've learned over time, but in the hiring process, it's the same thing. Um, you know, it starts with even like your website. What is that? What does your website say about you and who you are as a company and what values you uphold down to the, uh, you know, job description that you put up to say what kind of person you're looking for and down to, again, hiring somebody. And oftentimes what we found is, yes, it's great to have somebody that's super talented, um, but it's not, if they don't fit with our values, and they don't align with our values, we tend not to hire them because we found over time, no matter what talent they have, it cannot overcome kind of, again, the interaction you have as a group. And so um, the, the best part of this, I will tell everybody is that, um, again, whether you're bricks and mortar or, or, or virtual, by focusing on your values, one of the things we've benefited from is we have a very low turnover rate, especially for ad agencies. 
um, it's just, it, it's almost like we don't lose people. And, and, and that's a good thing because I can't, that saves a lot of money in rehiring and people tend to be genuinely happier. Go ahead, next one. So understanding these values, you guys have to understand it's living and breathing and what we mean by living and breathing, it's not creepy as Mick Lee would say. Uh, it's, it's living and breathing in a sense that they change. And you know, every time you allow individuals to become who they are, there's going to be new things that's going to pop up. Technology may actually influence how your values changes. So you have to be willing to accept it and then you be able to come back and refresh and say, hey, do we need to add this as a set of our values? Because if we're at it, you know, again, it's living and breathing. And at the same time, can, you need to take away things in there that no longer reflects who you are. So again, make sure you're constantly, you know, not just shelving it, but actually looking at it and uh, altering it and changing it as you need as it needs to be. Go ahead, Jackie. And then, again, to get team buy-in, you have to uh, look at treat each team member as unique, as, as, as an individual. There's going to be different things of different preference. And this goes back to that leadership again. You know, you're going to find out what's unique about a person through those one-on-ones and through those conversations. And you'll be able to extract the most out of them. And the way you can do that, again, it, to me, it's, it's, it's simple things like um, th people communicate in different ways. And, and so maybe you can't expect a person to automatically come up with ideas right there at the meeting and you, they need heads up or something. So by knowing that about each person, you can customize how you treat each person and how they can collaborate with the group as a whole better um, by not asking them to conform to one standard process. Because that's the one thing I've, I've realized with, with virtual is there is no one con con conformed process that every human being is unique and you have to treat them that way. And, and because of that, you, you're able to engage them more and you get better creativity and collaboration from them. Go ahead, next slide. So at this point, I'm going to turn over back to Jackie to kind of discuss the how and a little bit more nuts and bolts of, of all of this, how it all works out. So if you're not singing in your head yet, you're doing it wrong because we are intentionally trying to get you to get these songs playing in your head. Um, as Edward was saying, um, it's important to have values and, and again the difference between virtual and bricks and mortar is you do make a lot of assumptions in bricks and mortar you see somebody they have a, a frown on their face you assume they're in a bad mood you assume they're mad at you all kinds of things um, and you're probably most of the a lot of the times you're probably wrong um, so that's one of the benefits of virtual is that you do have to ask and you do have to um, go over your values again and again, do we agree on this? Do they mean the same things to everybody that they mean when I say it, does, it, does that what it means to you? And so in a lot of ways it's easier if you take those extra steps because if you're making assumptions while you're virtual, then that could be really, really bad. Um, so we just wanna talk a little bit right now about the act of brainstorming, um, bringing people together in a room to talk about a problem and a solution to that problem. And so these are some of the things, um, again, that are critical in virtual brainstorming, but also really handy in bricks and mortar. So the first of all is when you come together as a group, somebody needs to be in charge. Somebody needs to be in charge of that group. And it should be a different person every time because that mixes it up. Everybody has a different style. Everybody has um, different um, goals. And so that, but somebody needs to be in charge and especially you've noticed already on these calls and I'm sure in your own um, Zoom calls, one person can talk at a time. So if somebody's not in charge, then there are people who aren't, who aren't talking, who aren't participating or somebody who's talking too much. So that's important. And also to know what your goals are for the meeting. Are you trying to go through a checkoff list to make sure everybody's done what they're, they're supposed to do? Or are you trying to come up with something new? Is this intended to be a brainstorming meeting? And again, I've seen that a lot um, over my career where you come into a meeting and you don't know what you're supposed to do when you get there. Am I supposed to just say, yes, I did that? Or am I supposed to come with ideas? So knowing what the goals of the meeting are and then sharing those goals so that you tell people ahead of time today at this meeting and 
I, and I know most people send agendas ahead of time. I'm a big fan of agendas ahead of time, so I know what to expect. But am I expected to come in and have ideas? And if I'm supposed to have ideas, can you give me a hint what there's, you know, what am I supposed to be thinking about? Or am I just coming in to, to go down a list? Um, and this is a really important one. And, you know, Edward's going to be talking about specific technology. But this is more about communication tools. So are you, you know, the one that I learned in my 20s, I think, that has, give, that has done really well for me is if you um, email back and forth three times, pick up the phone. That means that you're not understanding each other. And you're going to just get more and more frustrated as you go back and forth, pick up the phone. What's interesting is, you know, I've been working for my house for a long time, and I've talked on the phone more in the past three weeks than I ever did before. And it's because we don't have in-person meetings anymore. And so I don't know what's, you know, I don't know what's going on with Nicolee in her personal life that might be affecting, you know, how she responds to a question I have. And so that's something that's just really important is to, you know, sometimes it's easier to text, sometimes it's easier to email. A lot of times it's pick up the phone and that's my least favorite, but I've been doing it like crazy because it's really necessary right now. And especially right now when everybody's stressed out, you know, everybody's got something going on that we can't, we don't necessarily understand. Um, size matters on the size of the group. Um, sometimes two people on the phone is a lot more productive than three or four or five in a meeting. So you need to, again, look at your goals. What are you trying to achieve and figure out who actually needs to be in that meeting? Who needs to be there who can contribute intelligently? Um, three is a really good number for brainstorming, but sometimes, like I um, help coordinate the Reno Women's March, for example, and it's so important on something like that that you get diverse opinions. And so some of those meetings will have 15, 20 people um, because we need to make sure that everybody's viewpoint is represented in that. And then it becomes more and more critical that the moderator is able to manage those meetings to make sure that everybody feels heard. Um, diversity doesn't happen unless the, the people speak and share and tell you what, what, what you need to know. Um, but on that same matter of diversity, um, everybody, like Edward was saying, everybody's different. Everybody comes with a different viewpoint, different life experience, different everything. And if they're in your meeting, they're, if, there's a reason for that. And they all, and we all learn different. Some of us learn by seeing, some of us learn by talking, some of us learn by um, reading or whatever it is. And you need to understand what your different people, how they learn and how they communicate. Um, Edward and I both in meetings, we sometimes will figure stuff out by talking. You know, it's like we have a problem and so we'll say it out loud, we'll start saying it and then we'll go, oh yeah, that's the solution. Sometimes I do that with my dogs. I'll just say it out loud to my dogs and then I figure out the problem or the solution. Other people, um, and this comes down to introverts versus extroverts, um, introverts get their energy from being alone, extroverts get their energy from being with other people. A lot of times um, with Nicolie and I, we're a really good team because I'm 93% extrovert, she's 93% introvert. And so we come at things, even though we're the same, demographic from a socioeconomic, you know, um, everything else, race, gender, we come at things from a very different point of view. And so it's important to not only um, listen to what she's saying, but to acknowledge that that difference is important and valuable and that, that I need to hear it, that I need to hear what she's, and a lot of times when I, I'm thinking something, I'll, I'll go to her first because I know we're opposite on that. Um, and this is really, really important. This is not my number two on my three secrets to life is to be nice. Um, it's so easy when you're getting into a, a, a brainstorming session or you're trying to figure something out and you just get excited. And sometimes we get a little bit mean or we're, we're rude or we cut people off or we're, or we're disrespectful. And that's the one that I think has probably served me better than anything else in my entire life is be nice and try to pull back. And I know that I have a tendency to talk too much and to overpower and I need to be aware of that and I need to be pulled back and I need to make sure that people feel 
um, listened to and valued. Um, and that's something I think that is really critical in, in a virtual environment. Um, and the last one is to be the safety net. So while we're being nice, that doesn't mean that I should agree with everything you say or that you should agree with everything I say. But if we, if we disagree, there needs to be a reason and I need to tell you, yes, I think that might be a good idea, but here's where I, I think that there could be some problems. And same thing if somebody is um, writing on a Google Doc and sharing their thoughts on there, you know, and you see a typo, you need to let them know that there's a typo or you see something that you think might be offensive to somebody that they hadn't considered. Um, you need to let them know. And that's the huge part of what Edward was talking about earlier. We're part of a team. We're all part of the same team. And we need to remember that. We need to support each other as um, different members of that team. So that was a lot in a very short period of time. Um, next, Danny's going to come on, and she is going to talk about some, some specific tactics that you can use to get the creativity flowing no matter what industry you're in. All right. Hi, guys. Um, Jackie, if you want to go ahead and hit that first little icon that's supposed to pop up. So if you know my friend, Michael Scott, go ahead and let me know in the comments. He is a classic. Everybody here knows The Office, and if you've had some time at home with more Netflix, all, I think, 10 seasons are on there. Um, but getting back into how do you be creative when you are working from home? I know a lot of people, even I, when I had other jobs where I wasn't in a virtual environment, driving to the grocery store, driving to the job, driving anywhere, I always pulled inspiration from going to work or being outside. Um, and so some other ways too that you can do that while inside, while we're all practicing social distancing, is to start writing your ideas down. I do this when I approach social media posts that I have to write on behalf of our clients or blogs or any sort of that sort of thing is I, I channel my inner Michael Scott and I do the thing where I say sometimes I start a sentence and I don't know where it's going and I hope I find it along the way. That's how I found a lot of my creative ideas and the fact that it's just to open a Google Doc, stream of consciousness, write it all down, and you'll I've come up with some brilliant ideas, different taglines, different um um, losing all the words right now. Obviously, I need to go write some stuff down. <laughs> um, but just like bringing it all down really can help either spark new ideas and or just refine ideas that you've already had. So Jackie, you want to hit the next one? Um, and the other idea too is that you shouldn't have to recreate the wheel. So if any of you guys know Alison Galden, she is a gem. And she introduced me to this book right here called Steal Like an Artist. This is an amazing take on creativity in the fact that if you think about anything that's ever been created, it is a stem off of something else. And the um, idea that what a good artist understands is that nothing comes from nowhere. All creative work builds on what came before and nothing is completely original. So when you're looking at these, there are so many things and resources that you can pull from to steal like an artist and make it your own and take inspiration from others. Um, Jackie, do you want to hit the next one and hit it one more time? Um, so kind of stemming from that is while you're at home, there you have your coffee table books. Half the time your spouse or you have bought them to sit there and look pretty on the coffee table or on your bookshelf, actually take the time to open up and read those books. Steal Like an Artist, again, great example. Looks really pretty on a shelf, but is full of amazing material. You can do this with any sort of art book, or I've seen ones that are all about growing plants or other things, and it's just a new way to jog creativity. Plus, it's in your living room. You don't have to go far to stimulate yourself with something you've probably never even opened or read before. Um, the next of that is it's at our fingertips. We're literally on computers right now to talk to each other. The internet is the magical fountain of inspiration. Um, personal ones that I love to go to all the time through the internet is starting off with social media. I'm a very visual person as like I'm creating graphics or just like visual and me are very into one another. So Pinterest and Instagram are great places, whether I'm looking for hacks on how to do something or different colorways that would look really great for a potential logo or anything like that. 
those are really great places to start. And now TikTok is the leading form of social media, at least within like younger demographics, but a lot of people are stuck at home. So these trends for songs, dances, everything is starting within that platform. So take the time and learn it. I know that it's a whole other social media platform to learn and that can be a lot, but it is really entertaining. I do want to throw out there to um, set a timer for yourself. You can get sucked in. Um, but on the other side of that, within the internet, you have access to so many other things, case studies, thought leadership articles. Um, there are a ton of creators doing free Instagram lives or webinars or master classes or anything online right now, because we're all kind of staying at home and working on our best way to be virtual. And so just pop on one of those. Usually they're like these about 45 minutes, an hour long. You can sit, gain some new perspectives, get connected with other people that can start sparking ideas for you and all that good jazz. Um, and then finally podcasts. I, listen to podcasts, you're at home. You don't have to worry about headphones or other coworkers or anything like that. So if pump up jams aren't doing it for you and you want to talk about something else, armchair expert is really great. NPR is awesome. The pitch is great. The way I heard it is an awesome little podcast and it's all just telling stories, but the way that they tell stories, they kind of tell it from end to beginning. Um, so even just going through a tale of somebody's life from a different perspective is really helpful in drawing ideas on how you can write stories and further other sorts of um creative things in your life jackie do you want to hit the next one maybe i jumped ahead of myself um and the last one is to change your environment take a break you are at home and one of the brilliant things of being at home is you can Take a break for 15 minutes, go switch that load of laundry and get thinking about something, recharge, pull on your inner introvert, spend some time alone, think in the shower, take a walk, go work outside on your deck when the weather eventually decides to get nice in Reno again. Um, there are so many things that you can do to just take a break, chill out and come back with a fresh idea or perspective. Um, going on to the next slide, Miss Thing. Um, so when it also comes to collaboration and bringing in, so you just, let me rephrase. You have just got all this creative inspiration ideas. You're ready to go. You're ready to jam. Jackie's given you all these amazing tools to brainstorm and collaborate with your team. Edward set up the perfect way to get a really great culture and respect dynamic going with everybody. So how do you bring that all together? Icebreakers and bonding are so key into making this a well-oiled machine of creativity and collaboration when you're in a virtual environment. So one of the things that we do personally within Estepona Group is we start our meetings with a little bit of water cooler chat. We talk about our weekends. We talk about the best and worst part of the week that we've experienced so far. We talk about random funny things that we saw on the internet, or we even open it up and talk about how we're feeling about the current state of the world and coronavirus and everything that's happening. Um, we've also, Jackie, you want to hit the next one? Tying in with that, we use a platform called Glip. It's our instant messaging platform. It's like a Slack or a Zoom chat. And we've created a special channel in there that is called Water Cooler. So when we do find these articles on different thought leadership ones or just funny memes that brighten our day and kind of pull us into a more creative space, we throw all of those in there we have a little place for our own personal water cooler in a virtual environment. And that's super rad. We also have one for acknowledgements because it's also really important to acknowledge the other people on your team. Like how Jackie called out Mickley at the beginning of this meeting for being a rad human, throwing those in the chat and making sure you're also checking in with your team and telling them when you're doing a good job, because you can't just pop over to their cubicle and be that person. Um, Jackie, do you want to hit the next one? Um, Another way to kind of break the ice bond and get to know people is to create a collaborative playlist. We've done that on Spotify and um, whatever songs that are just really either hyping us up or great to work to and put in the background or just bring a new energy to our workday, we've thrown that all in a playlist and our whole team can collaborate and share. But also when you get to know someone's music taste and what they like to listen to, you get to know them better and knowing your team at the end of the day helps you be more collaborative and creative with them. Last one, Jackie. 
And finally, virtual happy hour. I know I love myself a nice glass of red wine. Um, Jackie does as well. And so getting together with your team, even on a Zoom chat, to talk about things that aren't work. Pour yourself a drink. Have your kids run in the background. Your dogs are there. Someone, the pizza man is delivering you a pizza because you're supporting a local business during this time. Whatever it is, seeing where people live and work. Obviously, we're in my little jungle nook right now. And so from that, you can learn from me that I love plants. I love color. I love fairy lights. You get a better insight into people and who you work with. And when you know people on that deeper level, it makes it so much easier for you to collaborate and create with them. Um, so at this point, I will be turning it back over to Edward and I do want to make a note that for all of the NC team members, all the resources and everything I just talked about, we will be collating them all into a PDF and sending that to you. And if you're not an NC team member, but joined us today, no problem. Um, just feel free to email one of us and we'll get that out to you. So Edward, back to you. I'd unmute. <laughs> um, so uh, the what is really now, it's interesting because we've spoken a lot about uh, the human side of things, but uh, I want to spend a little bit of time technology, not because I think you guys need it, because again, you've probably been dunked into it, but um, kind of want to go over some tech that I think has been very useful to, for us and how we use tech again, and also um, how we view tech. So Jackie, go ahead and go to the next one and then click onto the first slide there. So the first one I want to talk about is video. I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of tools out there. We know uh, specifically there's Zoom. Everybody talks about Zoom. There's Microsoft Team. There's Ring Central uh, video. So video is important. And the reason, again, for us why it's important is oftentimes we find ourselves when we do video, uh, we actually will do screen sharing. Similar to we're doing screen sharing right now, um, with, uh, with this PowerPoint, but instead I'm doing screen sharing with an app like one of the Adobe uh, uh, apps that, that's out there. And so I can be talking about something with somebody and then they can, if I give them control over it, they can now take control of my screen and be able to do things. So in a lot of ways, video allows us to do that collaboration where before in a bricks and mortar, I would say, hey, come over here and look at my screen. Can't do that anymore, but you can still do it using the uh, video uh, tool technologies that are out there. Go ahead on the next one. Um, so uh, voice is still extremely important. Uh, it's It's been around for a long time and it's not going anywhere. And I think again, there, there's a place for it and understand again with technology, as Jackie said, understand when you have to use it and when you don't have to use it. And, and voice to me, it's when we get into some of our, our, our private messaging channel, our, our messaging channels or emails and things, you can start seeing things um, pile up, like it's an ongoing conversation. It's usually a good time to stop and actually get on a call. So for us, we have our voice over IP phones, which gives us our direct extension and lines. But in addition to that, obviously our cell phones are set to, uh, so that all, you know, if you call my, my landline, Basically, it goes to my cell phone as well, so that I'm always accessible, and we try to be accessible for each other. So even though I may not be in front of my computer, I can at least still help another uh, coworker. Go ahead and do the next one. Um, messaging, and so I'm not well. Well, the image here is messaging, text messaging. We still use text messaging, but I'm really more referring to messaging uh, systems out there like uh, Slack, Glip and uh, Microsoft team and that allows you to actually carry, uh, a, create a channel for each single thing you wanna talk about. So for instance, with us, every single one of our clients are on a channel. So if Jackie talks to a client and they had something meaningful conversation that they said, Jackie will put in whatever it is in that channel. Now I happen to be in a meeting and I, have, I come back three hours later, I can actually look at that channel, every one of these channels within 15 to 20 minutes and be able to be caught up to everything that everybody has done and what clients are saying and what we need to be doing. So I'm not bothering people. So it's a very efficient tool that actually allows us um, to, to stay connected. And that way, when, some, when Jackie has a question for me later on, I'm actually already in the know and I can collaborate with her right away. So that's why mess these messaging uh, type of platforms are really good. Go ahead. And Ed, can I just add to that? Um, I worked in a, in a 
bricks and mortar agency for about 10 years before I went virtual. And one of the things that's awesome about Glip is there might be something in there that has nothing to do with my job. Like if in a traditional agency, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in the meeting and they wouldn't tell me what happened. But I see it in Glip and that allows me to go, oh wait, there's a PR opportunity or there is a sponsorship opportunity there. And so I'm actually feel more connected because of that than I did when I actually worked virtually. Mm -hmm. Hit that next one. And finally, document sharing. So document sharing is things like Google Docs, uh, Microsoft 360, Adobe Cloud. Um, again, you want the ability to be able to share documents. Um, there are things right now that are you can do sharing, but it may require one person at a time to make changes. And so we, again, this is important to look at this technology to make sure you've got the right one. If you want multiple people making changes all at once, then you got to make sure you have, are in the right platform for that. So when we look at tech, and, and it's, this is the other thing, when, you know, when I was talking earlier about values being living and breathing, so is tech. Uh, it, it, it will always replace itself. I mean, we have been around for 12 years on a virtual system. So voice over IP was one of the very first tech we brought in. Uh, for instance, but now we're on our third voice over IP system in those tw in that 12 years and The reason why is because we found something that was better. We can't just set it and forget it Not with tech you have to kind of stay vigilant about it and try a lot of different things do a little trial and error It's never going to be perfect right now Everybody's in probably in for about three weeks now going virtual and while the tech you have works There's probably a lot of things that doesn't work and so sometimes it's processes that's not working, but sometimes it's just playing out the technology. So don't be afraid to ask anybody, uh, especially even for us. I mean, I know in this setting, this is tough to be able to ask questions. I know you, there's a chat right there that you can ask questions because the, the presentation's over soon. But even after this is done, if you guys want to shoot us email or somebody wants to give me a call, I can be more than happy to talk about tech all day long because I'm a propeller head. But I was told to only keep this to three minutes. So. I'm done at that point with this. So Jackie, go ahead. And I think we'll turn it over at this point for questions um, for anybody to have. And again, those questions can be done by uh, adding it in the chat section and, and Cinnamon will uh, moderate those questions. Uh, Edward, we've got a really great question from our Reyes. They want to know how secure are these services when it comes to HIPAA or PHI information if you're in the healthcare industry? Wow, start with a hard one. So right. in, every, yes, in, in every case, um, uh, Ring Central, for instance, is pretty safe. The only part of it that's not as what I would call safe to me is their, their video conferencing component of it. And because it's powered by Zoom. And we've heard a lot of those issues um, specifically tied to that. Microsoft 360 is pretty darn good. Um, Microsoft itself has all of these systems built in, um, as well as Ring Central. So again, each one of those, if, you, if you're looking at any of these systems, you wanna just make sure from a tech standpoint, especially for HIPAA, that they do have HIPAA certification. If they don't say it, that doesn't mean they don't do it. They just, you have to ask it and then just ask if they have HIPAA uh, uh, certification because that is super important. Great. And we had a wonderful comment from John Bokelman to everyone. He dropped in the chat an outline of what he uses as an agenda when setting up a meeting. So that kind of spurred a question in my mind. When we're in this virtual environment, we don't want to just have meetings to have meetings. So when you find yourself in that kind of situation as a leader, Edward, what is the best way to address it and get everybody refocused on having meetings with value? So for me, again, it goes back to um, our values and our values itself. We don't like to have meetings for the sake of meetings, but we like to collaborate and innovate. So if the meeting we're having actually brings on innovation and collaboration, then we say, okay, have more of those meetings. If it's not, and it's not working, and let's not, it's just common sense for us. Let's not have those meetings. And oftentimes I, I myself have a difficult time in meeting settings when there's five, six, seven of us together in one group. I, I feel that I have a harder time connecting with people. I'm better one-on-one. -on -one. So oftentimes, 
I won't have a meeting for sake of meeting. I'll just call Mickley or I'll call Paige and say, hey, you got a second. Can we discuss this? And so usually I find that is much better. You're not having a meeting for the sake of meetings because every, you know, corporate environment world, everybody's just having those meetings because they, they want to look busy. <laughs> now, one of the things, and again, this is trial and, trial and error. You know, we've, we've done some things, tried them, didn't work, come back. But one of the things that we meet every single Monday as a group, everybody as a group, because it's, you know, it's a reset. It's like you've had your weekend. Like Danny said, we, we chit chat about our personal lives for a designated amount of time. And then we catch up and it's like, what do we need to achieve this week? Um, what did we leave anything hanging last week? What do we need to do? And so it's really important on that to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, before this happened, we would have those meetings in person. And that's been a little bit of a, um, of, a, of a change to have to go virtual on those. But I can see, and especially if you're not used to virtual, those reset meetings I think are hugely important. I think too, it also comes down to what Jackie was talking about and both Edward and Jackie touched on this too, is knowing what your meeting is about. Once you, if you've sent out that agenda, what needs to be covered as well kind of helps like, you realize too, is this, could this be done via email or could, do we need to meet and talk and collaborate about it? So just setting up great communication, like stream systems within your team also really helps you finesse the system of, do you need to be in person for a meeting or could this be a phone call between two people? And I think that, that's, awesome. that brings back the question of respect too. It's, you need to be able to respect and trust each other enough to ask, um, is this meeting necessary? Or is this something we can do on the phone? Or is this something we can do through an email? And you need to be able to have those conversations without, without offending each other. Which kind of harkens back to that tip, um, really make sure the players on your team are the ones you want. <laughs> I mean, I think we've all been in those situations where we're like, oh gosh, that was not a good choice. Um, what is your best advice if you find yourself in a situation, you know, you can think that you vet a team member to have the same values, but let's say you're in a meeting where clearly there's just a clash and that's not the case. What's your best tip for redirecting that energy so that it's no longer disruptive and the whole team can collaborate again in harmony? So usually what we find is that there's something that's really like, maybe there's two people going at it really hard, you know, because from a standpoint, they're, they're kind of like very heated with each other. Um, I usually will table that part at that point, And then I'll have a separate conversation with each person, or they will have a separate conversation within themselves. I feel like, um, again, it's that respect thing. We, we all are so passionate at what we do that, um, we do get really heated up. And so oftentimes having that, just that one-on-one -on -one conversation can cool things down and having it in a larger setting where it just keeps on going, then you, you're asking people to take sides now. And that's not the point in collaboration. It's not about whose idea is the best idea or whatever. We've always felt like the best idea is always going to rise to the top. And you can't do that when you're screaming or, over each other. And it's kind of like when we're in this country right now. You've got Republicans and Democrats going after each other when really we should just be talking about it and figuring out how to work together to solve the problems. And we have, again, different views, but we still can do it. But it, it done best in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And so for me, if they can't solve the problem, I'll try to solve the problem. And we've had problems in the past, again, to the trial and error. It, we do our best to vet somebody and it didn't vet well. I'll go through and do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching, be honest with them because that's the other thing, you know, that's one of our values is the transparency. So I'll tell them, this is what I see and this is what other people see. We're not trying to pick on you. This is just what, what's happening. I don't, I don't know what's going on and I don't know what's right. And so you try to coach them up at the end of the day. And over time, that person's either going to self-correct or you're going to find out that, hey, this is a mismatch and it's better for both to go separate ways. And I think that's what, you know, we've experienced over that, this whole time being virtual, we've been able to, you know, get through that process and understand what works and what doesn't work. Perfect. Okay. So this is an update uh, from one of our 
members in the audience, Sharon Ng says Doxy, D-O-X-Y dot M-E is HIPAA compliant video conferencing for telemedicine. So for any of our friends who are facing that challenge where you need to stay HIPAA compliant, Sharon Ng is recommending looking into Doxy, D-O-X-Y dot M-E. So we're almost uh, at the top of the hour, four o'clock. Are there any more questions coming in? We'll keep an eye on that. And Tobias, just a hair more time for your questions to be typed in. I'm gonna ask a question. What, and this is for all of our panelists, what do you find has been the most surprising, rewarding thing to come out of working virtually for the last 12 years? Because I think it is a really unique take on a company. It's not something that most of us are used to. And I'm just really curious to know what was the most surprising, rewarding thing to evolve out of being in this type of environment for so long. One of the things that I um, have discovered, like I said, I started in 1997 when my son was born. So I was working at home with not very much technology in an infant and have been able to go through for most of my child, my kids' childhood. So I was able to be home for them and they came home from school in the afternoon when they were in middle school. And that combined with my own energy level, like I'm super creative at six o'clock in the morning. And so I can get up, work, be super creative until like 10 and then do other things and then stop at three o'clock when my um, daughter would come home from school, spend some time with her and then go back on and maybe work until six or eight o'clock at night, depending on what I needed to do. So one of the things that I really like for us, um, because we trust each other, we know we're going to get our work done, is that we're able to um, follow our own rhythms, our own um, energy rhythms, but also have our, our families, you know, be there for our, our personal lives as well. And that, that has been hugely rewarding for me. Danny, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'd say, so I came into the virtual environment straight out of college. So I can't really speak to what I've seen between being in a bricks and mortar environment to being virtual. I'm very lucky in that sense of I got to kind of start out this way. And I guess for me, it's been a lot more of like self-discovery and self-determination, um, holding myself accountable for what I need to do within this team and how to make it work. But also. Um, even just like for me, the flexibility, I know I have friends of mine who can't just like they can't just go to the doctor appointment because they have to take off that time from work three weeks in advance where my team trusts me enough and I trust my team enough to know that they if I need to step out for an hour to go to a doctor appointment or go grab lunch with my mom that I'm still going to come back and have my stuff done. So I think for me, just being brought into an environment where I can be more flexible and like Jackie said, with your time and who you spend it with and how you still get your work done has been really beneficial from me working at home anyway. From my end, I'm going to look at it from being a boss. Um, I think it was interesting and brick my, I always consider my career in two lives and it's the brick and mortar life. And now it's the virtual life. And when I was a bricks and mortar boss, I was really extreme type A and it was my way or the highway. And I learned uh, maybe it, it coincided about the same time going virtual to having kids. So one way or another, I had more patience and I'd learned to trust. And that trust I think is a big thing because I think my people see it and they know it and they basically um, feed off of it. And I think that's what's created this culture where you've got this trust with all these people. It's like, I don't worry about if somebody's taken off to take their kid to soccer practice, they're going to get work done. It's never about um, when they're working. It's about the quality of work and is the work getting done on time. Those are the, the only two things I have. I, I've, I've stopped looking at timesheets and all those nonsense things because at the end, we're going to get paid the same way, whether it, you know, whether it took, one minute to do or whether it took 10 hours to do because you know you have the set pricing that you, you've got so to me it's that developing that trust within the team that's just been amazing because um i know a lot of teams struggle with this a lot of bricks and mortar struggle with this there's a lot of uh second guessing somebody and from and that that just created all that extra drama that we don't have in our agency and so we fill that space up with fun things as opposed to the drama 
So that's, that's, I think, the most gratifying thing from a virtual environment after 12 years for me. But that's another benefit, too, Edward, when you talk about hiring smarter and making sure people fit with values. In a bricks and mortar um, environment, you might take a chance on somebody because they seem nice. Um, but in this environment, you're not over them. You're not babysitting them to make sure that they do the work right or to make sure that they're you know, doing what you expect them to do. So you have to be a lot smarter and a lot more strategic and selective in the hiring process. Um, I've, made, I've made some bad hires in my career. Um, always in the bricks and mortar. In this environment, you, you can't risk it. Like you have to be smart on this one. So a question coming in from Marie, with that being said, Edward, have you changed the way your employees are paid transitioning from brick and mortar to virtual, knowing that there's so much freedom and so much flex time? And obviously we don't want to cross any HR boundaries in regards to pay. Yeah. Just yeah. As a I pay um, salary. I don't believe in hourly. The only time we deal with hourly is when we're bringing interns, and even that has presented some challenges for us with internships. Uh, we've learned that internships works best in the summertime for us, and and it's it's when we have them all to ourselves, and they're not going to school, and they're not doing anything else. And yeah, we pay for internships, and we pay hourly for that, but the rest of the people are paid salary. We, we pay a fair wage. Um, um, I don't try to discount uh, my salary is just because these people, I think these people are getting flexibility as trade off. It's, it's again, like any other business, any small business, you can, you pay what you can afford and you do your best and you're honest with your people. Um, so I haven't changed. Uh, we were always salary, but we had a couple of people hourly, but it's just easier to manage when everybody's on salary. So that's what we've done. Great. Uh, Debbie says, excellent, Edward. I appreciate your perspective and hope that others have the same discoveries during this time. I, I would be, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was thinking about this. And um, one of the reasons I went to work for Edward um, six years ago is because of the virtual environment. Um, I would have a very difficult time going back to an office at this point. And my kids are grown and gone now, so it's not about them anymore. But um, it's, it's such a rewarding environment. And I feel like a lot of people are gonna discover that once you get through the initial shock of it, you are gonna discover how, how wonderful it is and how really productive you are. You know, you get an idea at eight o'clock at night and you just do it. You know, you can just get up and do, and do the, well, don't get up, obviously you're awake, but do the, do the work at that time. And then, you know, maybe, in a, and you make it up another place. It's a very freeing experience. I don't see any more questions coming in, so I'm going to part with this comment from Lou Mana saying, thank you to everyone and best wishes for health and happiness always. Happy holidays, Lou. Um, I also, Happy holidays, Lou. <laughs> we have uh, some more comments coming in. Thanks, EG. You are all rad humans and 11 years ahead of the times. From Veronica Frankel, thank you, NCT, for this session. It was refreshing to hear your creativity, ideas, positivity, and important reminders about leadership workplace culture, and being human. Some challenges this week made those reminders especially relevant. And like Deb, I hope others remember that right now. Health and best wishes to all. Oh, and Dave says thanks to me for moder moderating. Thank, thank you, Dave. you, Cinnamon. You did a terrific Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I want to remind all of our friends and guests, don't miss us next week, April 15th. We have another free live stream at 3 p.m. This one will be hosted by Christina Nemec and it is all about Get Real. It's a special workshop with a four-step process, and it's designed to help businesses improve their mission, morale, and bottom line through more effective language and communication, so don't miss that. Thank you to all of our friends at Estepona Group, uh, Danny Rawson, Jackie Shelton, Edward Estepona, and of course my fellow board member, Mickalee Byerman, for helping to collaborate and put this all together with the idea. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.